Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Artist Well. This is your weekly source of inspiration, enlightenment, and connection with artists all over Ireland and beyond. Now, before I make a start, I just want to ask a favor of you. And that is, if you're watching this on YouTube, or indeed, if you go to YouTube afterwards, um, would you please subscribe? It's just a little button below the video and click that. It doesn't cost anything. And you, then you'd become a subscriber to The Artist Well. And that just helps the sort of feasibility and viability of this uh, weekly program. And um, also there's a little button, a little bell beside it. And if you hit that bell, it'll send you an email which will notify you um, of any uh, new videos that have been uploaded uh, to that particular channel. So if you would do that, get your friends, your family, artists you know, your enemies, everybody, if they can do that, because I want to get the number up. It's 299 as of this morning. And I'd like to get that up to a thousand um, for various technical reasons, which I won't go into at the moment. But if you do reach a thousand, it, it's obviously good for, for, for the, um, um, the actual artist well itself. OK, so that's that bit out of the way. This is our 39th episode. And I'm delighted that Danny has joined us today, Danny Osborne. Um, Danny is, is a painter, but he's also a sculptor. He's uh, an environmentalist. He's an adventurer. Um, he has had the most extraordinary life. He was born in the south of England and studied art there. But very shortly afterwards, um, he came over to Ireland. And this is where his heart lies. Uh, and he eventually, um, having done a few little trips around Ireland, he eventually settled down on the Beira Peninsula. Now, when I say settled, I use that word advisedly because he's anything but settled. Uh, he's, he's an absolute nomad, a nomadic artist and has been all over the place. And he's going to share some of his uh, stories and travels with us this morning. So let's go straight down to Danny and say hi. Good morning, Danny. Hi, good morning. How yeah, are thanks you? Thanks everybody for joining in. I just, I'm, I'm not actually an environmentalist, but I do oh, give okay. out <laughs> frequently. You have opinions, Danny, yes? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, just, well, through... Yeah. My observations. Okay, so, yeah. so you're not a placard holder, but you, 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 you're very strong. Oh, exactly, but, uh, yeah. 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 So, Danny, tell us, tell us about your early years, um, because you, you didn't come straight to Ireland. You, you had a little diversion to the, the North Sea or somewhere. Is that right? Oh, well, when, when, I, when I left art school in, uh, in the south of England, I, uh, yeah, I went to and worked on an oil rig for six months. It was actually a, a gas um, wildcat rig in the North Sea and uh, and got a few hundred pounds together to come over here and buy the house that we're in now. Um, it was fairly cheap, it was 350 pounds and um, uh, had the best part of a roof and uh, no windows and doors and things. And so I slowly did it up over the years and uh, until it's turned into this palace now. I see. Um, I did see uh, a very early episode that RTE did. You must have only been in your about 20s or something. Would that oh, have been yeah, the, the original? That's right, the, the Dave Shaw Smith uh, yeah. uh, piece on the, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think that was in about 1970, seven or eight or right, six, right. something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So was that, was that the original house then? Uh, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, so you were very, very near the sea. It, but um, there was probably still, still a window needed blocking up and that kind of thing. So, your early part of the career, how did you build up your career? Because, I mean, you're, you're somebody who came in, you probably had very few connections um, in Ireland at first. So how did you build up your career? Well, uh, in, well, in 1971, when I moved over, I, I knew nobody here at all and um, just moved around until I, I found a place I liked, which was here. And um, so when I moved in, uh, I quickly got to know Tim Goulding, who uh, lives the other side of Allahy's. And he was uh, very, and is a very generous, uh, spirited person and was what was wonderful and uh, in, introduced me to the, the art scene in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And so I started uh, exhibiting with the uh, Irish Art Exhibition of Living Art and the Oroctus. Mm -hmm. They yes. were the main open uh, exhibitions in those days. And um, so it went from there and then you know, I, I uh, approached 
Bruce Arnold in the Neptune Gallery that's running, and so I went in mm -hmm. with them. Um, in, yeah, in fact, uh, there, I think there was only about three living artists there. There were mainly uh, dead artists that, that the gallery dealt with. I know there's, there's Martin Gale and myself and one other. It could have mm -hmm. been Neil Shawcross, or I, I forget exactly now. But, uh, okay. And then, uh, yeah. so yeah, and then I started, you know, producing more work and going on trips and having exhibitions which helped pay for them and that kind of thing. And you did a bit of work in the ceramics area with the likes of Irish Dresden and Royal Tara, isn't that right? Uh, yes, hmm. yeah, because, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I had no money. I wasn't on the on the dole or anything like that. And uh, so, hmm. um, yeah, I did a, I, I did a, a small piece for the uh, piece of work for Royal Tara. And in Irish Dresden, I made a series of birds for them, these sort of edition yeah. of birds in porcelain. Mm. And, uh, they, they were great, they were very, very nice to work with. And um, yeah, they're still going, but you know, they're having a rough time because of the whole COVID thing and uh, sure. the way things are. But um, yeah, I haven't done anything with them for a long time though. Yeah. No, no. And before we, before we get on to your expeditions, let's call it, uh, in general, let's just focus on one thing, which, which um, a lot of the, the great unwashed, like myself, would know you for, and that is the, the extraordinary uh, Oscar Wilde monument that you did. So would you mind talking a little bit about that? Because it's very interesting in, in that it's not, it wasn't your standard uh, piece of sculpture. It was actually quite a complex uh, thing. Yes, yeah. Well, it's the, uh, the piece itself is um, made of different colored stone, and mm. all, all very hard stone. And yeah, I was lucky to, uh, make contact with uh, Professor Chris Stillman in Trinity, mm. who uh, suggested certain types of stone and put me in touch with, uh, with people who knew where I could source them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like the nephrite jade from the Yukon and uh, thulite, which is a very rare pink stone from central Norway and uh, such like. So it was, um, mm -hmm. You know, if that was made of marble, coloured marble, for instance, it would only last a few years before it would uh, dull down and would really not see any of the colour at all. And then the the shoes are Indian um, granite, Indian, or something, is it? Black Indian granite, yeah. Yeah, and, and they're highly granite. polished. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. It lasted well. Do you know, it must be twenty two or three years old now, um, but it's never been touched or repolished or anything it's still just no. as bright as it ever was it's it's, it's wonderful yeah, yeah yeah and, and the D D dublin parts have looked after it well because they uh, they washed the stone you know, the big giant quartz boulder which it's sitting on they just washed that last year and um, mm. so it looks white again it looks like a big giant iceberg is sitting on it really does and i, I gather you found that yourself up in the wicklow hills yes yeah yeah, I mean, that, that's, and, and so, I mean, did, were you traveling around for long to find the thing you wanted? Uh, well, m myself and uh, my brother-in-law, Noel Scullion, who's also a sculptor and, and worked mm -hmm. on that uh, with, with, with me, um, he, uh, you know, just motored around until we, mm. uh, up in Wicklow, until we came across some outcrops of quartz and then uh, thought this is good and contacted the Forestry Commission and said, they said, great, take it away. So this is a 35 ton lump of, of uh, quartz, which is a, it an amazing piece. I, was, I went up there the other day just to have a really good look at it because I wasn't aware of, of the, the precious stones and all that kind of thing that, that, that are, were used in this. Yeah. But I believe also that you made a plaster cast of it so that you could bring it down to your home or to your studio. Yeah, off, um, off of the boulder, yeah. Yeah, because his, his foot is resting in a particular little, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. How long did that take but, you to produce? The reason, the reason why I um, I wanted him like so colourful because mm. of, partly because of his character, but Oscar was very interested in uh, Greek uh, Greek art. Mm -hmm. uh, it, all anything Greek was like the, was the epitome of civilization to him. And, sure. Uh, yeah. And a lot of those Greek early Greek marble carvings that we see mm. so beautifully and in, intricately carved are were actually painted. In, uh, when they're in situ for for a long time and it's, oh. it's all, all worn off. Yes. So, so you know, the, the, a, a lot of the colour uh, sort of referencing that. 
Yes, yes. Well. Also, yeah. the two bronzes, which are e either side of the uh, the main piece of Oscar, they're you know, in bronze, and they sort of reference Greek sculpture to a certain extent as well. Not particularly. And, the, and then, as, yeah, then Constance's wife also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it, it is an amazing thing. And I've never, ever been there, including, you know, during the week when you'd imagine there weren't any tourists. But whatever tourists there were, they were there and they were yeah. taking photographs. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'd like to think it was because it was my sculpture, but it's, I mean, it's largely to do with Oscar Wilde as such a. Uh, oh, I don't think so. I think, I think, I think it's the fact that it is so colorful and unique. Yeah. You know, I think it, it could stand very anonymously there as well, and no one would they'd be all passing by it, but it, it's got a, that real attraction yeah. to it. Yeah. And I love also your idea of, of the, the plinths on the other two bronzes, where people were asked to select sayings that Oscar came out with that were their favorites, and they're engraved in their handwriting. Yeah. So we've got our president, Michael D. Higgins, who's celebrating 80 this Sunday. Happy birthday. Um, and all sorts of uh, very interesting people. Did you coordinate all of that? Uh, yes, I did. And uh, yeah, I contacted all these people and, you know, including people like Bono and mm. Charlie Hawhey. And they, uh, almost, almost everybody uh, gave me a quote which referred to themselves or, or, or they, yeah. they found important or relevant to themselves in, in some way. So it's, uh, yes. yeah, that, that, that's very interesting. Yeah, so, some of that's on, that should be on my website, at least who chose what. That is indeed, and and also there's, there's a, another uh, very interesting film that that, that is in there, um, which goes through the whole process of you making the various parts, because they were done at stages and so on, and you'd see that. The, yeah, that did. Yeah, 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 that, that, yeah, yeah. Deirdre Mulrooney made that made that little film. It's great, isn't it? it, it just, it's it's uh, super. It just it's quite informative and uh, yeah. it's very informative i would suggest that any anybody who's interested in this would, would, should actually look at that uh, video there's a few yeah. other videos on your site also yeah. and it's simply dannyosborne.com so you you won't forget that yeah but, yeah and, and it's also on the um dublin city council website as well i think is it really yeah 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 okay so look moving on from there um you 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 had the bug to travel now, I'm not sure the sequence of everything, but did you go to the to Chile, the Andes first, before you went up to the oh, Arctic? Oh, uh, I, I was, like, through, throughout the 70s, I was doing, uh, mainly concentrating on, on landscape of you know, the local, yeah. the local hills and, and scenery around here. Mm -hmm. And I, I became intrigued by the, all the, uh, uh, the evidence of the last ice age. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, all around my house is dotted huge erratics, erratic boulders lying around, and yes. and um, other you know, smoothed off boulders. And below the house, there's lots of scratches in the rocks where they're made by the glacier. And so I, I thought you know it was pretty interesting. And then I was going doing more sort of extreme paintings up to the tops of mountains and mm. things. I I just thought, well, I might as well go there and uh, and paint. So I went over there for three months in 1977. I was completely blown away by, by the place. It's just so amazing, and the, the Inuit people are, are fantastic. And many of who were still my friends after, you know, nearly fifty years. Yes. And uh, so that, uh, and then I had an exhibition in the Neptune Gallery of, of all that work, which I, I did over three months. Mm -hmm. And then um, soon, with uh, my friend Jerry Wardell and I. Uh, organized the first Irish Arctic expedition and we uh, went to northern Ellesmere Island for six months after mm -hmm. a year's preparation and yes. um, uh, organization and uh, so we did a lot of work scientific work and I did a series of paintings on the geological processes mm -hmm. and uh, some bird work and John O'Mara who's their third member out there uh, made a very nice film called Beyond the North Wind. Yes. And uh, and we also had a, another member, Philippa Kidd, who was an administrator in the mm. office and kept things together at home. All right, okay. So, yeah, that was and, a big operation. In, like, yeah. Huge budget. <laughs> it was amazing. Indeed, I'm sure, yeah. But there was a time then when you, when you went up for 13 years with the family. 
Was was that after your travel down to the the volcanoes? Uh, 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 let me see. Yes, yeah, because yeah. after uh, after the Irish Arctic expedition, mm. uh, uh, where I met Geraldine, in fact, and she was a, a volunteer packer in our warehouse, and oh. uh, packing all the all the gear. And uh, so we got married uh, when we got back and when I got back and then um, I wanted to go straight back to the Arctic, but she wanted to go somewhere hot. So <laughs> <laughs> because there was the greatest number of volcanoes anywhere in the world in the in this part of the Andes. Yeah. And so, uh, so we went there for and did this trek right down the middle of the Andes from uh, Guatemala uh, to, sorry, not Guatemala, from um, Bolivia. Mm. Going down between Chile and Argentina for about 600 kilometers. Yes. Over many months. And we bought seven llamas to carry all our gear because mm. they're the only animals that would survive up there in the winter. And it was winter. We, we went in the winter because uh, there's no water up there otherwise, except there's snow in the winter. And mm. um, so we can, you know, we use that for, for our water. And, carried all our supplies on, on the llamas.
So look, you, you've, you've made several pieces of sculpture and then did you bring them back to your studio? Uh, yes, well, I, I've, got a, I've got 46 completed pieces here, in fact, um, mm -hmm. all stored away in boxes and stuff like that. So hope, hopefully I'll have a, a good exhibition with them Sometime. And is there a particular theme that, that you, you had in mind well, all the time? Well, this, the all, well, this sculpture is uh, it's mainly based on around, um, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, colonialism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because uh, I, I, I first, the, 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 those ones I, where I, I first uh, perfected the, 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 the technique which I'm using was, were done in Guatemala. And there's a uh, there's a lot of evidence of the the colonial co colonialism there from yes. the Spanish mm -hmm. uh, conquistadors and and all all the rest of it. And then I started relating it also to you know Hawaii, where I was working as well on the on the volcanoes there. Yes. And you know and being Irish as well, uh, I you know obviously sympathise with. Uh, with any country that's been under the heel of colonialism, mm. uh, and, and like all these other countries, and it's a scourge of the earth, and uh, these rich, uh, powerful countries bully smaller countries, and uh, it's it, you know it's part of the system now, but it, it'll have to change eventually. Sure. Sure. So that that that's an upcoming exhibition that that's likely to happen in the next couple of years, is it? I hope so. Yes. Yeah. 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 Very good. Okay, so let, let's go from the extreme heat to the extreme cold. Um, I know you, you paid a few visits uh, up to the Northern Territories, but then came the opportunity of going en famille, bringing your, your three children with you and yeah. your wife, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what year was that and, and, and what, what were the plans exactly? Uh, well, well, just previous to that, um, and, uh, other trips. Uh, Geraldine's family very kind. Her mother once, and then her sister and and uh, brother-in-law uh, stepped in and, and looked after um, the child and then children. Mm. And so, in uh, 1989, uh, we went up to Ellesmere Island, um, yes. and we took them with us, and we we uh, had a, a year-long trip up there. And it was uh, so we we planned to more or less fo follow the uh, the Im last immigration route of the Inuit over to Greenland, mm. and um, so we had a a team of dogs mm. which were only transport. Yes. So and I I trained them over the winter, mm. and uh, in the spring we we set off. Um, and were, the, were you the, you you were the first non-indigenous people if i can put it that way to have made that trip um well with children <laughs> yes the children all right yes <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah there's well, a fabulous it, photograph it had been done before uh, there, there were people greenlanders crossing over and then there was a there, there was another um uh, uh what white man's trip mm. there uh, yeah before that which we were unaware of in fact at the time mm. um, mm. But, um, the fact that you had the kids with you made the difference there. Uh, yes, yeah, that, that made it into a, quite a big deal. But in fact, we we uh, we only had a six month visa to stay in Canada uh, at that time, and mm -hmm. the weather was still very cold in March, and we found it, it was just too cold to travel with the children. Um, and you know, we were doing uh, smaller trips around out of Greece Fjord, which is um, the, and this. Southern Ellesmere Island is yes, probably one yes. of the most isolated and, uh, <laughs> uh, communities in the world. It's, mm -hmm. uh, there's only uh, 80 people, 80 Inuit living there at the time. But really? They were wonderful. We had a fantastic mm. time there. But yeah. anyway, our visa ran out and there was a, an RCMP guy there who insisted that we leave the country. <laughs> Let's and uh, so we, what we had to do is we chartered a plane to go, take all our dogs and gear and everything over to Kanak in Greenland and did the journey in reverse. And in fact, we, well, so we, we set off from Kanak um, after a few months ago to do some hunting to get meat together. 
and uh, and all the rest of it. And uh, but we only got halfway, and before we came across open water in Smith Sound, which mm. was disastrous because it mean, meant we were stuck in Greenland. Yeah. And uh, the the uh, um, let me see. Uh, it, it it was literally the first time it had happened in living memory, like the, it, a month before it had ever happened before. Mm. And then uh, when we looked at the records and stuff uh, a couple of years later, we found that was the, it was really a key year for um, ice melting that, that, yes. that quickly and lack of ice in the Arctic Ocean mm. and stuff. That, that, that was one of the first real signs that we saw of, uh, of the depleting ice cover. Right, right. And, uh, anyway, so we, 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 we got back to, uh, back to Greece Fjord in Ellesmere Island after a couple of months and spent the rest of the year there, um, traveling around in the ice, and then um, a, a year, uh, and then a month over with our friends, the Akiagos in uh, Devon Island, uh, caribou hunting. So that was wonderful. Then we, we came back to Ireland after that. Yeah. I always like to draw whenever I can, whether it's a 30 second scribble or even a more detailed work. Looking at the sea ice and the glacier, looking at how the sea ice and glaciers affects the land is what drove me out here in the first place. Because much of the southwest of Ireland where I live is so similar to here. The, uh, all around my house is massive erratics which trail up the mountain and other, other evidence of the, uh, of the action of the ice thousands of years ago. But you want to be dress, dressed properly because the weather is always changing. When I'm painting, snow, snow, blowing snow is a problem as it mixes with the paint and makes it into substances like sand. Whether I'm in the studio or outside, I always use the same colours in the same way. Three blues, three yellows, three reds, two umbras, and titanium white. But I find that uh, if, if each colour isn't squeezed out, it probably won't get used at all. So I'm never afraid of wasting paint, I just have all the colours laid out whether I use them or not. Now the, uh, I use this plastic box as a palette and a paint box when I mean, it's handy so you can just close it up and throw it into your bag when you want to leave. Um, there's like well even in very cold weather there's no fear of the painting though of the paint freezing. Uh, it seems to be uh, really unfreezable almost at uh, normal temperatures up to about minus 40. And I've sometimes painted at minus 38, 39 without any problem. But uh, with a small painting like this one, I often leave it attached to the tripod and uh, just lash it onto my kamatik or sledge when it's finished and then, uh, and then go back to camp or home. Uh, or even if you just, uh, just make sure it's secure and then throw it over the shoulder. But uh, with a large wet painting, I have to put it in a box and screw it in. And uh, uh, and that keeps it secure and stops 
anything going on to the wet paint. I can show you a picture of that, that uh, technique later. When did you when did you go for this this serious family trip that was sort of thirteen years? Well, the uh, that was two thousand and one. Two thousand, yeah. We, uh, we we went we went out out then yeah. did, did that trip. But I'd been going back to Greece Fjord and taken the quite reg, quite often and mm. taken Oshin and all uh, the children with me uh, on a couple of occasions as well. Yes, yes, and. Um, uh, so that, that they, they were kind of used to it. <laughs> no. Yeah. But then you almost moved out permanently. And um, what, what I thought was maybe if, if you don't mind, if I could ask Geraldine to come in at this point, because one thing I did notice about the two of you is that you seem to very much work as a team. Hi, you know, hi, hi Geraldine. Chair. <laughs> Pull up the chair. Thanks for coming along. <clears throat> Thanks. So, so listen, just from your perspective, um, you know, th this is a major upheaval. Uh, packing the whole family up, the two of you, and heading off for a couple of years. You know, did, did you have it in mind that you were going to stay that long at the time? No, not at all. Actually, I was working. I was working for, well, the Southern Health Board at the time. I was working in public health. And I said, um, I asked for a year leave of absence, yeah. and uh, which they agreed to. And I said, maybe two years, because the job was, for, I got a job um, in, in uh, Calloway, um, as a medical officer of health with the newly formed government of Nunavut and um and I was you know I thought a year or maybe two at the most but we ended yes. up staying what 13 or 14 I think. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah yeah so, so the young, when you went there first the youngest was one year of eight one year old no that was uh no uh, actually when we went to 2001 our, our children were all in their teens they were all in secondary school ah, okay um but no that was the earlier trip in 89 they were very tiny children um, yes which was uh, a much, uh, it was quite a different place, even though it's all part of Nunavut. Nunavut's huge, it covers a, thir a fifth of the landmass of Canada. You know, it's, it's enormous territory. Yeah. And um, uh, the Greece Fjord where we went in 89, when the kids were small, that year we spent there, that's um, a thousand miles or, or a thousand kilometers further north, over a thousand, yeah. Oh, really, yeah. You know, above the Arctic Circle. Yeah. Like, um, Iqaluit is just below the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. So Iqaluit is like the capital yeah. of Nunavut. It's it's a city, called a city, mm -hmm. but like it's tiny. It's, you know, yes. <laughs> tiny, tiny city. And um, it's where the government of Nunavut is located. And that's where I got the job. Um, right. Yeah. And what was the intention to go there at a time where they were getting their independence? Was that any anything to do with it, or um, just know, coincidental? It was, you know, it was just. I think I was a little bit fed up in my job, and um, mm. Danny wa always wanted to go back, and this was a nice opportunity. It was a good opportunity because they had just um, got their own uh, self-government, their own territory. Mm. The territory of Nunavut was created, and um, there was a lot of um, optimism. Yes. yes. And opportunity. So. Uh, yeah, so I thought, yeah, let's try it out. Mm. And, you know, the, it was hard. I I was aware that it was kind of hard on the kids because they were in their teens, but they were great. Um, yeah. My eldest daughter was doing her leaving cert at the time, so she stayed in Ireland and um, she knew what she wanted to do anyway. She wanted to go on to study art, yes. maybe, which she did. And right. so she stayed. She didn't want to come. Yeah, but mm. they... Mm. 13 year old, uh, old and 14 year old came with us and they went to high school there and, and they loved it. They settled in and loved it. And they're very happy that that's the way it worked out, actually. Yes. And, I, and I'd, I'd say, I mean, you know, it was a really character building exercise, I would have thought, for the yeah. kids, you know, in a very, very different community and so on. Very much. It was very, they loved the outdoor life. And also the exposure to another culture was really very interesting for them. Fantastic. They were really yeah. Yeah. appreciative, so do, I think, in their teens. Yeah. Do, do you miss it now? The two of you? Well, yeah, I, I'm sure Danny probably misses it more than I do because I have family <laughs> here and yes. know, I guess I'm a bit more connected. But yeah, but we do go back uh, to visit uh, quite quite a bit. Um, do you? Not yeah. to it, but, 
um, and we will go back again for sure. We have a lot of really good friends there, and we also, yeah, it's it uh, has been home to us for quite a long time. Mm. And, and excuse my ignorance, but do they speak Inuit there, or, or I think the word is uh, Inuktitut. See, Inuktitut. I, I've been spending all last night learning that. <laughs> yeah. Inuktitut, yeah, lovely, Inuktitut. lovely name. Yeah. Yeah. In Inuk means person and tut means speak. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, yeah. Inuktitut. Inuktitut. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about the language. Is that is that widely used or not? Um, it's a lovely language, but unfortunately, like a lot of indigenous languages, it's uh, dying out. Mm. Um, there are a lot of efforts, of course, to keep it going, but really, yeah. I think the forces of um, the outside world are very strong. Mm. I mean, it is the official language. As they are everywhere. Uh, Yes, yeah, yes. It's a bit like Irish, it, uh, yeah, when it's not used, it's going to yeah, go down and down. Fly out, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, One thing I should mention too, that might be of interest to you, um, Alan, sure. and we didn't mention anything, is that when we were in uh, Greece Fjord, it was quite different to our time in Iqaluit, our 13 years in Iqaluit, mm. because it was so far north, it was so traditional, and also it was three months of complete darkness in the winter, and then in the summer, continuous daylight for three months yeah. because we're just so far north um, and that was really interesting you know it was yeah. uh, quite an experience. Did, did, did it affect your sleep patterns or your work patterns or did, did that change very at much, all? Very much. Very much. <laughs> very yeah. much. Oh absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. it's uh, you know it was good that uh, our eldest daughter at the time Tempe was five and she was going to school so that imposed a routine on us because I mean otherwise mm -hmm. you just lose all sense of the 24 hour clock. Um, yeah. But then the converse in the summer when we were traveling by dog team, mm -hmm. it took so long to make camp and then break camp and you know pack everything up, get the dogs ready. Like yeah. it took hours to do all that. So it was handy because we could have a 36 hour day if we mm -hmm. wanted, which we did. Yeah. And we also um, traveled during the, it, get, it would get a bit cooler during the night. Because if you're traveling in the daytime when the sun is shining, the snow is very soft and it's hard going for the dogs. Yeah. So we tended to travel in the cooler, cooler time. Mm. But mm. it was really handy to be able to have that 36 hour option yeah. and not be stuck to I know. for our clock. Yeah. yeah, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, do you know what we'll do now? We're gonna, we're gonna have a quick look at the, your studio, okay? We have a little video of that, that both of you did. And um, then we'll, we'll look at some of your work and some of the photographs, because there's a fabulous one, Geraldine, of I'm sure it's yourself and, and, and the children that Danny took, and you're all in your caribou skins. That's right. Just, yeah, just having had a nice feed of raw fish or something like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see that later on. Yes. So listen, thank, thank you for that, Geraldine. And we, we'll go over now and, and look at the video of your studio, Danny, okay? okay. This is a studio. Uh, here's the part of the studio where I do my painting when I'm inside. So, when I'm working outside, I take this aluminium uh, easel with me. It's light and extremely strong. Sometimes I take a few bits of rope to lash it down to stop it being blown over when there's a canvas on it. Here, the studio easel, which is, one, one, which is very strong and can take big canvases, you know, seven feet, no, no problem at all. It's a sturdy one. Okay, so I, uh, I use uh, bits of thick window pane glass for palettes. I normally put a piece of white paper underneath. And so when you're mixing colour, you can see the true value of the colours against the white, not against some, something else. And um, often when I'm painting, I'd, uh, I <coughs> put a sample of the mixed colour on a piece of paper. So here I've got a lot of uh, lava sculpture stored in these boxes. In fact, I have uh, 46 pieces. Most of them were cast in Guatemala and Hawaii. Well, the most important thing about this sculpture is the material itself. To me, it's a deeply symbolic substance because the, the matrix, it's the matrix of everything in the world. Everything here came from lava. So when the world started to cool down four and a half billion years ago, this is what it looked like. 
Everything on the surface was lava, and as it cooled down over many millions of years, all the minerals and elements separated out and metamorphosized into the rocks and gases that we have today, including, of course, chemically bound water, which formed our oceans and lakes, then plants, and us humans. Now, we all came from lava. So if somebody says Mother Earth, they aren't speaking figuratively, they're actually speaking literally, whether they know it or not. So this is a, an oil stick painting of the cow rock, which is quite close to here in fact. It's seen from different points sailing around it in a boat, showing how a, an object changes with different perspectives. Okay, so up, up here there's some uh, original models which I did of some fairly well known people. So here uh, I have my small etching proofing press which I modified by putting a bicycle wheel on it to make it to easier to turn because it's quite, uh, quite hard work otherwise. Although uh, I normally go down to Cork printmakers uh, to do larger stuff because I'm a member there. Um, underneath I've got a, a plan chest which I made out of plywood and I keep all my paper in there. It's, it's a great way to keep it flat and protected. And um, on the walls there's uh, some metal strips and magnets for displaying drawings. So these, these drawings are from my last trip to the Arctic, all looking at the movement of sea ice and all done on the ice, except when I got them back here I just used a bit of graphite powder rubbed into the sky uh, just to give them a, a bit more body. So at the end there's a, a four foot drawing of uh, a lava flow, uh, one from Hawaii, and um, that is done in charcoal and it's what I did in the studio here, but I worked it up from a smaller drawing. And um, that's done on arches paper. And in fact, these other ones we just sort of looked at a minute ago, they're arches except for one which was done on Somerset paper. And uh, of course, you mustn't forget the skeleton here, which uh, I found so useful over the years. Uh, especially when you're doing sculptures of people trying to work out some of the difficult, difficult sort of anatomical bits, you know, like things like wrists and elbows, they're quite complex pieces of engineering. And it's really handy to, to be able to refer to something like this. I got it uh, over 40 years ago. I swapped it with a, a Scottish doctor for a, a dog. Well, Danny, I always knew you had a skeleton in the cupboard, but I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I have other cupboards. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? <laughs> okay, we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah. So um, that was very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, Danny, what we do now is we, we go and look at some of these, the slides because I'm, I'm anxious to, yeah. to move along quickly so that we can get enough time in for questions and answers at the end. Sure, yeah. So if it's okay with you, I'll go straight into the yep. mm -hmm. into that. <clears throat> All right, off we go. Uh, okay, well, actually, the I think the first uh, three slides or so are to do with the various trips we made uh, in the nineteen eighties because we had an incredibly busy time then. This was one, one I did on the Irish Arctic expedition in 1981 in northern Ellesmere, uh, the inland ice. Um, and uh, yeah, I re really like the, <laughs> these, these rocks sticking through on the right hand side. They're, um, they look like Japanese brush strokes in a way, but they were, they were exactly yes. like that. Yes. But uh, that was a very beautiful place. Mm, looks like, yeah. Uh, this is. That, that, that one, that, that the, the, sorry, the previous uh, painting, it, it's only about uh, 18 inches or, or maybe two feet. Uh, and watercolour, presumably? What? what? In, uh, no, that's oil. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yep. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. Yep. And um and yeah, so, uh, Lama, yeah. And um this was uh yeah, we call it Expedition Andina, the 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 six months expedition Geraldine and I did in uh the Andes. Uh that's me at the bottom leading the llamas <laughs> and Geraldine at the back trying to push the, the last one on who's dragging his feet. All right, okay. Yeah, so we kept we carried all our gear with film gear, I uh lots of paint painting gear and uh like five foot canvas stretchers and in which I I did a, a, a three or four paintings that, mm. that size and they were all carried on the llamas. Yes. Yeah they're, they're fantastic animals. Yeah. Beautiful yeah 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 uh this one's we we were part of the uh the Irish uh Changsty North Peak of Everest expedition in 1987 mm -hmm. um and this was from uh, from the North Coal, uh, I think looking towards Primoria, I think. Uh, yeah, I remember we, uh, we, were, we were sharing a tent there with uh, Mike Barry from Tralee, uh, who's uh, one of the uh, climbers Yes. as well. But um, yeah, the some of the, the shapes of the mountains are exquisite. Fabulous, yes. Yeah. So, now, this is the Greenland crossing. Yes, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, so this is our, our dog team, um, 11 dogs, occasionally we had 12, but uh, 11 dogs there, so you can see there, there were the kids in the back, Geraldine's obviously taking the photograph here, but um, yeah. so we, by the time, uh, you know, I'd, I'd run them the whole winter and things, they were going like a Rolls Royce, they were a wonderful team. Do they take much training, Danny? Yes, yeah, they... I, I got a friend to buy them for me the previous uh, summer, the previous mm -hmm. year, and um, he put them on on an island uh, called Dog Island, which is traditionally used for putting the yes. dogs on in, on the summer. And they, because they all came from different teams and different places, so they fought a lot. And uh, I think there was a, a couple got uh, got lost without trace. But uh, all the winter they were fighting quite a lot. I mean, this there was. Uh, I, I just what does he know? Yeah, that that one. Um, that, that's the lead dog, the one out front, Caillou, who actually swapped um, a bitch in Greenland with uh, Telelingua Piri, who uh, um, he, he wanted a he wanted some puppies. They were delighted to have new blood coming into in, into that part of yes. Greenland. So the Canadian dogs were very very good. Okay. For that, but um, he uh, yeah. in fact, there was, I think there were six hundred dogs in that village, really, and uh, what was it seven hundred dogs and four hundred people, something like that. I mean, it's yeah. a a lot of dogs, and at night it was beautiful. They'd all start singing together, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's quite a quite a wonderful sound. It's a bit like sheep and whales. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're well outnumbered. <laughs> anyway, this is a, this is a picture of your daughter Orla. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's all uh, helping me cut up a seal. Um, yeah, yeah we, we ate both seal and the dogs ate seal as well. Um, but uh, I mean, Orla's all, all now a, a biologist who um, working in the west coast of Canada, and is so she? She started young, and she's always been into mucking in with that sort of kind of thing. Fantastic, fantastic. Now this is. This, this is called the Osbournes. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, the, these clothes, in fact, they're made of caribou skin. They're, they're made by our neighbours in Greece Fjord, who are incredible uh, at, at uh, making clothes. But, you know, there's still mm. no better ma material has been found for making warm weather clothing than caribou skin. It's been used really? for thousands and thousands of years, but it still hasn't been uh, improved on or superseded. It's uh, there are slight problems, you know. They, it's a hair fall out and get in your food and stuff like that. But, yeah. but uh, and you you have to sort of tend them a bit, uh, much more than say uh, some artificial clothing which people use now. But they they're they're amazing. And the one all is wearing down at the bottom, that white one, it, it's actually the caribou skin is turned on the inside with that one. And so it's just uh, the uh, leathery skin on the outside. It, it's oh, easier yes, to... Yes, on the outside. Unfortunately, it's more like a suit Did of... Did you bring any of those home with you? What? 
You can bring any of them home with you. Uh, well, Kamiks, yeah, just just the boots. The other ones we um, uh, we, we we sold sold to get to other people. Yeah, afterwards because they're not tanned. They're just the skins are just scraped, and because it's Ooh. extreme dry climate, they uh, yes. they don't rot. But you bring them here, and they uh, and they um, start course, to yeah. rot. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I love that photograph. I think it's great. <laughs> yeah. So, and this this is um, walking to Cod's Head, is it? Okay, so yeah, back back, back in Ireland again. This, this was uh, this is about uh, six six foot long painting um, where I was, you know, so just lo looking at the the local environment and how it how it had been shaped, and that. So um, this is one. So I, tried, I actually originally did this for Allied Irish Banks. Did you? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And um, so yeah, it uh, it has, has a lot about the early early stages of the of the thing. So when when I went to the Arctic, you know, this would be a a, a painting which I did out, out in Greece Fjord, uh, up in El Ellesmere Island, mm -hmm. of a of a ice hummock on the sea ice. Um, that's quite a small painting. It's only about uh, eighteen inches, maybe two. I'm going to ask you that. Yeah, it's quite, quite quite a small one, but uh, there I, I love these form ice forms. They're so dramatic, and show the whole dynamic form of the uh, of the sea ice. It's uh, it's wonderful to paint. And this is bad form. And, uh, this is a uh, quite a, a big painting. It's at least six foot long, which I did in a, a place called Bad Fjord. Um, and um, I went out there and uh, for, for, you know, for, from town, it's about, a, I don't know, maybe eight, 80 miles uh, out, out of the village. Mm -hmm. And um, so I didn't camp there. It took me about uh, 10 days or 14 days to, to paint the whole thing. But I camped a, a mile or two away just, uh, just near the coast because there's a lot of polar bears visiting there um, because you could see they, they were so tall, they, you could see them for miles and that sort of attracted bears in to come and check it out. Oh, right. they're, yeah. they're not as tall as they look actually, these clouds cutting through the top, they're, they're formed by different layers of hot and cold air which are very uh, stable and they stay there mm -hmm. and so the, the clouds just sort of sit there. It, it's about a hundred feet high, that, uh, that tallest one there. I, I see something that looks remarkably close to it uh, on Jerry Wardell's uh, wall exactly <laughs> he's the owner All right. <laughs> well thumbs done. up yes yes very good yeah 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 okay so, move on so the next couple of paint uh, photographs actually relate to that because when i was painting that uh, this wolf came and visited me um and uh, was very interested and in, walked round and round and round me about six or eight times before heading off to to uh, see if he could find any baby seals or something under the ice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, probably checking out your did, sandwiches. Then he came back again and uh, yeah, and then went off. Uh, I, you know, I've often had uh, encounters with wolves like that, and uh, they're, they're, they're normally uh, no, no threat at all. Even uh, when you get a, a pack of them, they, they're not too interested in me, mm -hmm. except if you have dogs. They, they're, they're very interested in dogs. <laughs> They? Um, but um, yeah, yeah, there was. I mean, there was one uh, one encounter I had with the wolf, which was which was pretty mangy, and uh, these sort of long legged thing kept coming too close to me. And I, uh, it's about eighty miles north of this place. I, so I fired my rifle up in the air, but instead of running away and backing off, <laughs> he just came in close and started walking like a crab. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> Oh God! So, I, uh, so I fired again up in the air, and then he he he, uh, he went off. But I, I sort of I felt a bit guilty about feeling so insecure with him. I, I don't think he would have done anything, but um, mm. I just didn't trust him. <laughs> now, mind you, there are grizzlies around there too, aren't there? Uh, polar bears. I mean, there's no grizzlies up that far north. Oh, they're not. Okay, um, but yeah. polar bears. Yeah, 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 there's there's a lot of bears around, but. Mm. I found I'm. I mean, I'm all, always on the watch and have, have a rifle re ready. But um, generally, when uh, bears are around in the spring, they're not really a threat, uh, unless it's maybe a, a young teenager or something like that. 
because uh, they're okay. you know they felt yeah. fairly well fed. They got uh, plenty of seals to, to live on and such like. Well, then, so, that's but okay, they, yeah. but they they are around. And they do. If you're away from your camp, sometimes they yeah they come and they come and beat up my tent once and shredded yeah. it and things like that. But um, never had any uh, serious encounter. Okay. But uh, this, uh, see, there's that painting, but it's just packing it up to, oh, yes, to get yes. back to the village. See, it's in a, a box, mm. um, just a, a pl thin plywood back and then a frame. So I shove it into the box and then put two screws in either side and then put a, another piece of plywood on the top and just secure that. And then I can lash it on the kamutik, you know, which is my sled behind. Mm. And uh, it's fine to travel when it's wet. And it goes the same same thing for small ones as well. Just have a small smaller box, and so that that's the way I transport them because you know they, they take a few weeks to dry and yeah, you wreck them on, on the way home. Otherwise, there's my big prospector's tent there for uh, make, makes it comfortable to camp in. And I mean, did your did, did that ever break down? The skidoos, hmm. uh, yeah, they are they often break down a bit but I, this this one here is very simple uh little machine and so you know I, I learned how to change a piston and uh to do obvious things or if something happens for the undercarriage to yes and yes. sort it out or the ski sometimes gets broken and you have to do some sort of a job on that just to get you home yeah, so you need, Nowadays, you need... they're, they see they're they're, they're going to make two strokes illegal and so they have this it, four strokes, which is a very heavy machines, but they're, they, they all have microchips in them. So when somebody breaks down on the ice, you're relying on a companion to, uh, to tow you home. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, they, you generally can't fix them. So that, that's a big problem. Well, for mm. me, I, cause you know, I, I generally travel on my own. Sure. So, okay. yeah. All right. No, oh, this is meta incognito, incognita. Sorry. Yeah. So well, I put these few slides in here just because I I felt I'd sort of done enough painting of uh, of the dynamics of the sea ice and the and the the way it glaciers sort of cut through the mountains and things. So I I started to uh, look <clears throat> at the landscape in a different way. So the, the this one here is it's divided into three sections so th this actually sort of joins onto the onto that bit on the left hand side and then the and then the middle one will join onto the bottom one so so you've actually got uh, you know quite a 50 60 miles of coastline there all right yes and so what i do, do generally is go down the down the coast and paint a bit here and then stop and then paint a bit more mm. further down yeah and uh, yeah, that one's actually got a bit of a narrative uh, hidden in it. But um, anyway, but th this this is the same sort of thing with the uh, with lo long stretches of ice. Uh, uh, sorry, long stretches of coast, which all join up together. And uh, I, I was just keen to try and put more information into one canvas rather than just having a, a small bit of information, put yes. a lot of information <laughs> into yes. it. So you know, it's a, it's almost like a map. Some of these things. In fact, if, when you go on to the next fill uh, slide or next photograph, um, oh, sorry, not not that one. But that, that that's again. So this is back with the same sort of thing. Yeah. It's looking at the tops of the uh, tops of the hills going along the coast, um, and uh, they all they all join together. Yeah, they, they're kind of a bit like sort of notation in music or rhythms as, as well. Mm -hmm. They're rather lovely. This, this particular one I did from a drawing. Actually, it's a big painting. It's about uh, uh, five or six feet high. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, so some of them I just paint straight straight on and and that. So and when you go on to the next one, um, the uh, I started putting in, including maps into to show the actual position where I am when I'm painting it. So th this is a glacier, um, which actually got nicknamed Danny's Glacier for a while because uh, there was, um, I almost got 
killed by <laughs> by a huge lump of ice which uh, which came popping out from underneath on, on the bottom of the sea really? where I was camped yeah. and popped straight through the uh, through the ice which was like four or five feet thick mm. and uh, sent huge lumps flying over my head and um, just the pressure pushed it out. Yeah, were the most deafening we've ever heard. What? It was just the pressure pushing it out. No, you see, what I hadn't realised was the the glacier uh, didn't terminate in what what looked like a, this sort of the uh, the terminal cliff. There, it actually went on down underneath the sea, and out out and underneath uh, hundreds of feet down. And what had happened? A piece had just broken off. In fact, I heard it. I heard this sort of funny noise under my feet uh, just before it happened and then the thing exploded underneath me right. and uh, went, f went flying across right right, right over me yeah. and so of course I just ran the other direction as fast as I could and then it was completely silent after I'd run about 100 yards and looked back <laughs> like nothing had happened. Wow yeah but anyway, the so I started doing some maps which had scratched back into the wet paint, mm -hmm. and the at the very bottom there's the the glacier, uh, the very bottom of this map, and with light lines radiating out which show uh, the the lines of view, which I got. It was uh, so it's just yeah, uh, you know, it's just another way to try and put more information into it mm -hmm. rather than just the. Uh, just the obvious. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. And so yeah. I, you know, I did a number of those and then I kind of stopped doing those now anyway. Oh, th this is a, this is a, a, a wool, felted wool wall hanging, which I, um, like an exhibition which I did. I had about four of these six foot square um, uh, things there. Uh, but we, I, I remember we, we had a, um, in, every year in, in Iqaluit, we'd have a, an arts festival, you know, mm -hmm. up there. And um, so some craftspeople and artists would be brought up from the south sometimes. And one year we uh, brought a, uh, somebody who does felting up. She did a, a workshop, a three day mm -hmm. workshop. And I was sort of looking at the form to what I put my name down for. And uh, this woman next to me, it's a rather beautiful woman said, oh, God, I must put my name down for that. I love felting. It's even better than sex. <laughs> so I thought, oh, <laughs> I must have a go at that. And so uh, Geraldine and myself and all her daughter put, put her names down for this three day workshop. And we yes. loved it as well. It was it's, yeah. it's so it's, it's such fun doing and just fabulous. And I, I love the quality of the the colours that, that come off the wool, you know, this different, yeah. it's got a totally re different reflective surface. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, and, um, and you know, all it does, still does a lot of it. And Geraldine and I do it uh, a bit more of it. Uh, mm. Yeah, and we'll be doing some more in the next while as well, some big, yeah. big pieces. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Yeah, that's uh, Gu, who's the director of the museum at the time. And uh, it is one of my uh, lava casts. This is a conquistador's helmet. Mm -hmm. And um, quite a lot of those because, um, you know, the, the imprint of the <laughs> of conquistadors is, is still strongly there in, in so much of uh, Central and bits of South America. Mm. Yes. And all the sort of colonial um, shadow. Yeah. There's another piece. Yeah, and this next one. This is a, a pith helmet, which I feel it was, was really um, a symbol of colonialism, more modern colonialism, mm -hmm. and uh, how, how it's affected people. I mean, these hats are still used in in uh, military and police and uh, things. You know, the, you know, the style of the the pith helmet. Um, occasionally, you get it's lovely iridescent. See that sort of blue yes. color. Yeah. Sometimes it's quite dull and textured, and other times you get this. Wow, this amazing. Uh, uh, iridescence coming off it and mm. things you can't tell really how it's going to come out it just just comes out yeah. we're nearly the end here yeah. this is james love lovelocks oh, oh yes yeah so well this is actually the yeah it's a drawing i did uh, just just uh, recently uh, on mm. the side of hungry hill which is uh, just the other side of castletown bear from us all right and, yeah um, <clears throat> Below it is the 
is a house which used to be owned by James Lovelock, who was the, uh, it's an independent English scientist who, uh, who came up with the theory of Gaia. And um, he's, yeah, he's written numerous books since then, but he used to go, he, for about 10 years, uh, him, himself and his family used to come over for two or three months every summer. And he used to walk up and sit amongst the rocks here, these, these old red sandstone mm -hmm. up, uh, up just above his house. And he said he used to, you know, think about the, uh, about his life's work and how everything fits together. And, and he, he slowly put all the pieces to, together of the, uh, of the Gaia theory, which is how the world is a, is a self-regulating world, which life regulates itself it adapts slowly but it also regulates the environment in order to uh, to, to to comfortably live mm. and he, he wrote the whole of his first book in that that little house down there mm. and um i i just thought it was just the whole uh, associations with that and the, and his thoughts about the rock and he did experiments very often and uh in, they found out that Rock doesn't break down just, just just through mechanically mechanical erosion, you know, like freeze thaw and rain. It also it's accelerated by the action of plants and enzymes from lichen and things like that growing on it. So it breaks down ten times faster than it would just by mechanical means. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and this and this is whole part of the whole carbon cycle um, of how. Uh, how carbon is trapped in the soil and, and released. It's uh, so yeah. You know, it, it's it's uh, there are so many things that he uh, he came up with. He's a pretty amazing guy. He's still alive, uh, 102 years old as well. Is he really? Yes, yeah, lived oh, in England. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and still pretty sharp. Hmm. Yeah. This is so, called yeah. His, his aha moment. Is, is how how you titled it. Yes, well, well, this is where this is where it all came together. Yeah. Just uh -huh. uh, just down the road, which is just in the early nineteen seventies, mm. which is when people like myself and Tim and uh, Cormac and Charlie we were getting together, and you know, also thinking about a, a lot of things to do with the environment and and uh, and you know, doing. Looking at various aspects, you know, the spiritual aspects of the of the uh, of the rocks around us and things like that, and it, uh, it was it was amazing because we didn't know this guy was just up the road from us, also dealing with know, yeah, similarly yeah. related things. But he was a scientist, and we were kind of head cases. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Not much between them. <laughs> now this is our last slide. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, there's Oscar yeah. Wilde in in, uh, mm. in his newly cleaned rock. Yeah. Wonderful. So, Wonderful. I, know he... I, I would suggest people look at your website, dannyosborne.com, to to see those videos and this one in particular. Um, I think you'd find it intriguing. Yeah. yeah now, yeah. Danny, because of time, um, I I don't I want to ask you my little question first, if you don't mind, um, and that is, uh, if you were to be given or take or whatever, beg, borrow or steal, any artwork in the world from anywhere, museum, private ownership, to hang on your walls, to adorn your walls there at home, what would it be and why? Uh, well, because I had thought about this because you did yeah. warn me. <laughs> I did warn you. But, um, it, uh, and I, I didn't have much trouble coming up with Lucas Cranach, the elder, with this, his painting of uh, Cupid complains to Venus. Uh, or sometimes I actually have a copy here. Cupid and the, and the bees. Yeah, yeah. I, I I first saw this. Well, it was it's another version. He did about uh, more than half a dozen versions of this, which were very yeah. similar. The, the one I saw was in uh, in Brussels in the Musée de Beaux Arts there uh, a few years ago. What, was it the same as this one? Hmm? It's 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 very similar. Yeah, he, he did did very similar, similar okay. versions uh, to it, but it's um it's I'm sure Oscar Wilde would approve, <laughs> would have liked this painting. <laughs> He's no stranger yeah. to um, the uh, sweetness and the suffering <laughs> of love. 
and uh, but it's uh, you know it's got this sort of universal theme to it. But I, I also like the the painting itself. Like you've got this Venus uh, who's stark naked, but she's wearing this elaborate hat, mm. which is <laughs> and this wonderful hairstyle which must have taken her handmaiden about three hours or four hours to do and wearing a, a, a beautiful necklace sometimes mm. that the necklace is really adorned with jewels and, and things like that and yeah, it's yeah. such a contrast to the to the nakedness as well she's also adorned but it's not hiding anything but, uh, but Cranach had an amazing sense of humor he had a really bawdy sort of medieval sense of humor and some of his paintings are hilarious and yeah. they're well worth checking out great painter I'm sure he'd what's be... very interesting here is is that she she's looking at us sort of wistfully saying you know a bit of a come on uh, that's and, right actually yeah <laughs> poor little Cupid is down there saying I've just been stung to death you know and yeah. you could be forever <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, there's probably a lot of hidden stuff in there which I didn't know. So I, I, so I think it, I think the the I mean, the the honeycomb looked like it's been just been taken out of the that hole in the tree, which is a bit suggestive as well. It does <laughs> I, I yes. there's lots of other stuff there. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're right. I mean, Oscar Wilde would have had a field day with this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd say Lucas Cranach could be a great great guy to have a few pints with and, uh, <laughs> this evening. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Listen, that's super. Um, thank you so much, Danny. That, that was spectacular and, and really right. very, very interesting. This together. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it out to the floor and ask people if they have any questions. I can see in the chat that there are 28. Um, so what I'll do is look at some of those. And um, as I mentioned to you, there's a little emoji down at the bottom of your screen with reactions on it. And if you click on that, it has a thing saying raise hand if you want to ask a question in person. If not, just put it into the um, uh, the chat box, okay? So, um, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually work backwards. It's it's easier for me to do that. Um, so, Morland says, such an exciting life and display of your work, captivating. Um, Jacinta says, what is Danny's philosophy in life? Now, there's a million dollar question for you. <laughs> huh? I can't well, tell you, I'm afraid. Answer that. Try not to think about it. <laughs> I mean, you love solitude, don't you? Uh, I well, I, I, yes, I do actually. Yeah, I think yeah. alone time is very important to me. Anyway, yeah, yes, as well Thinking as time, the, being with people as well. I mean, I like, I, I do enjoy a crowd and uh, and being with my family as well and friends. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I but I do like being on my own very much. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Veronica Williams says, thank you so much. Have to leave now, but I will definitely watch it again. So interesting. Hmm. Um, Jacinta, oh, sorry, that was Jacinta, I beg your pardon. Um, Catherine Gagan says, love the Hungry Hill drawing. Oh, thank you, yeah. Veronica thing, I was saying, oh, better one. I quite like that one as well, actually. You, you know, sometimes you do work and, uh, and you think, well, I really like that. <laughs> Is there any work that you would never sell? Um, oh, I, I probably will eventually, but I'm, I'm using that for actually doing a much bigger painting of it. Uh, Are you? Yeah, which I'm just, just starting on, but so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll use it for a while and then probably get rid okay. of it. Yvonne Maloney O'Keeve says, uh, is lava surface easy to sculpt? I imagine it is soft, question mark. Oh, well, this was cast from molten lava. Hmm. It's yeah. all, all molten lava from an erupting volcano from, so it, it flows right into the mold and, uh, and then I let it cool down and then break the, the mold open. Yeah, but if you, were, if you were to hack a piece that you, you've actually oh. cast. Well, do you know, it's actually, it's not as tough as it looks in a no, way. No. Um, it's because it's a tight, it's a form of glass really. Mm. It's, uh, mm. That, because this lava, when it comes out of the, vent it's got a lot of gas in it and it's expanding so so there's a it's quite sort of aero like in some places in the center in particular yes. Yes. and um but picks up the detail of the mold more on the uh where it touches the mold yeah. and then it's, but it but it, it, it can be broken easily as well can it yes yeah. okay. nicola carrigan says the ice paintings are very powerful jacinta do you ever do any workshops uh, not really no oh, okay that's all right. Eileen McDermott-Rowe, amazing work. You should have a film of your life. 
thank you for a fascinating morning. Well, yeah, I'd recommend that you, you, you go to his website, uh, dannyosborne.com, and you will see that uh, early year um, documentary, which is very interesting. Uh, happy life insurance, <laughs> Catherine Gagan. Uh, well, no, we, we, we often, we, when we go on long trips, we, we, we always have to take some sort of search and rescue insurance yeah. because the, you know, the local countries demand it, uh, you know, when, when you're... I think what Catherine is alluding to... In Canada, I, you know, I, I don't because uh, I, I, I know what's going on so well and I have a lot of friends who, uh, you know, hunters and, and travellers. I know. Yeah. yeah. I think what she might have been alluding to is the fact that you were about two centimetres away from molten lava with your shoes there, <laughs> which looked a bit precarious, to say the least. Uh, well, well, I, I mean, I had the shoes have gone on fire a couple of times. But, <laughs> have they? Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, you can get boots, you know, like firemen's boots, which are uh, which won't go on fire, but they're extremely heavy. And you really need to be able to move quite fast when you're uh, casting lava to to get out of its way sometimes or just and so sure. being mobile is important yeah okay um bridget flannery says how wonderful to see the paintings and the journeys around them congratulations on, on this work uh, margie says great photos was it difficult to manage the llamas and the working dogs as well as your work and family says eileen mcdermott row yeah well, i mean all this took a, a great a great deal of time mm. and um like with the llamas uh we Geraldine and i went over to wales where this, we found this uh woman called ruth ruck she had a couple of llamas mm. there and and we learned a lot about llamas then before going out to chile um but uh llamas are much more common now and and uh, they're, they're they're more known but in those days we we had to go out and it took us i don't know three or four weeks to, to train the llamas, but the important thing was to train them to eat uh, some concentrated food because there was very little food or no food really up in the mountains and the volcanoes. Yeah. So we had to carry all this uh, like a bit of alfalfa and these dried like calf, calf nuts, things for them to eat. But to teach them how mm. to eat that when they'd not, never eaten anything like that before it was really difficult. And uh, I mean, one of the most died, Salvation. And then the leader, whose name was Snooty, uh, suddenly started eating it one day. And then all the others just started <laughs> eating it. Yeah. And it was great, it was no problem after that. And they and we were fine. But just to, uh, yeah, they, they took a lot of training. Yes. Um, okay. I, yeah, Yvonne says, uh, what an adventurous and exciting family life. Your drawings are really beautiful. Um, now, one person has put their hand up, which means they'd like to ask a question in person. And I think we might finish on that, Danny, and it's oh, Eileen McDermott yeah. Rome. Eileen, can you hear me there? I was just wondering whether it, the painting, your painting or your sculpting gives you the most satisfaction. Well, I, I do them at different times. Uh, so, I don't, I don't really see any, I, I don't get more satisfaction out of one than the other, really. I find them, in, in a way, the, 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 the sculpture is more, it, more exciting because there's, uh, you know, it's very physical. The, the whole thing process is very physical, lava or stone or, or anything. And uh, painting is more, more of a, uh, a longer process, but um, yeah, because I they're, they're done in, at separate times, it uh, <laughs> I, I don't really okay. know, but um, yeah, I mean it, it's all that work is great fun though. <laughs> it's, uh, good, good. Yeah, wonderful. Good. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Eileen. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, listen, we're we're way over time, but uh, having said that, with with good reason. And um, Danny, it just leaves me to say, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I know you put a huge amount of effort into the whole um, presentation and, and all of that. Uh, and I do appreciate it. And also Geraldine's help as well with it. It was fantastic. So thank you both very much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in person at some stage. Yes, yeah, yeah, and, and me too. And, and let me say thank you very much for 
inventing and getting together the, the artists well uh, series it's uh, it, it's really interesting to watch and i'm Thank very you happy that you asked me to be part of it yeah my pleasure <laughs> yeah. bye everybody thanks for everything Geraldine. thank yeah. you so much bye. bye bye now bye bye, bye. So as I was saying, next week, um, all will be revealed on Wednesday when we're visiting another artist. Uh, he doesn't live near you, <laughs> unlike a lot of other artists. Um, but we're visiting, I think, somewhere near Kilkenny. And um, we, we look forward to, to that. So the same time, Saturday, 10 o'clock next week. Uh, thank you all for watching. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.